which unfortunately happens to be the longest lecture of the whole series. So we're going to talk a lot about retina today, and I believe next week is orbit, and then it kind of starts going on to etc. So please look ahead of time and know what's what's to be expected. So the other tradition is, is you get the pleasure of seeing my travel slides. Now, historically what I've done is I've shown you slides from the previous ESCRS meeting, but because of COVID and the fact that the ESCRS was a week before the, a the AAO, I, I haven't been for three years. And so this is where ESCRS was this year. This is Milano. And unfortunately, this was a decade ago. So this is the Duomo, the cathedral in the main square in Milano. Inside of the cathedral, what's interesting is there are uh, murals on the wall on both sides. Let's see if we've got. Do we have our little pointer thing? Let's see if we've got our little pointer thing. There we go. Okay, so murals on both sides. Unfortunately, the it hasn't been spiffed up in a while, so it's really kind of hard to see them. But um, classic stained glass, vaulted ceilings. And this is some of the stained glass that you see. So we're going to, um, this is one of the popes. And so one of the popes is, is buried here in Guomo uh, in Milan. Okay, we're going to talk about the retina. Now, when you talk about the retina, we want to get a few definitions in there. And so from the pathologist, the definition of the macula is what? So I'm going to start, just going to start and swing around. Uh, where, the, where there's two or more than one layer of ganglion cells. Exactly. So the pathologist's definition of the macula is more than one ganglion cell layer. But that pretty much matches up the retina doctor's definition of the macula, which is the area pretty much temporal to the disc within the arcade. And so when we look at the retina, the retina has, I can't see anything points, just pointing. So what do retinas and ogres and onions have in common? Layers. Layers. All right, so we're going to start with the layers. And so as a pathologist, I look at the retina this way. When you have the uh, anatomists and the, um, and the research guys do it, they do it upside down. So you have to kind of turn your head when we do lecture. So, these are the layers. This is the vitreous on top. This is the chlorate on the bottom. So we're going to start going through the layers. So this is the vitreous. What layer is this? Hyaluron. Internal limiting membrane. Next layer. Inner fiber layer. Inner fiber layer. Next. I can't see a thing here. Next okay. layer. Ganglion cell layer. Ganglion cell layer. Next. Inner plexiform. Inner plexiform. Next. Inner Next. Outer plexiform. Next. Inner nuclear. Outer nuclear. Okay, and these are photoreceptors, and this is RPE. What is this? Choriocapillaris. Then we've got medium and large vessels of the choroid. All right, so we're going to start again at the top. Internal limiting membrane. What forms that? Foot plates of the Mueller cells. All right, so it's not really a membrane. It's the foot plates of the Mueller cells. Okay, and then what I want to do, you know what? Let's let's do a little bit differently. Let's trace a photon of light. It's a little bit easier to kind of understand the anatomy if you understand what you know what cells do what. So, photon of light goes through the vitreous all the way through the retina. It hits the outer segments of the photoreceptors. It hyperpolarizes the membrane and switches the uh, retinol switches from cis to trans. And you start to get a signal and it goes from these photoreceptors to this cell body right there. What cell body is that? Exactly, and it lives where? The outer nuclear layer. All right, so then that signal goes through the axons of this photoreceptor cell body, and it synapses with what cell right here? Uh, 
bipolar cell. Bipolar cell. All right. The bipolar cell lives in the internuclear layer. Internuclear layer. All right. So then that goes out the axon of the bipolar cell, and it synapses right here with what cell? Ganglion cell. Ganglion cell. All right. And that ganglion cell lives in the ganglion cell, ganglion cell layer. Good. And then the axon of the ganglion cell layer goes out. The RNFL to the LGN. All right. And where does it pass through to get there? Mm. RNFL. Yep. So trace that axon from that ganglion cell to where it synapses again. LGN. Okay, but where does it go to get there? They're this far apart. All right, so it goes out through the optic nerve, all the way out through the chiasm, and then all the way back, and finally at the lateral geniculate body, it synapses. So that's an incredibly long axon. And what it does is it, it allows any place along that long chain of that axon to be disrupted to eventually lead to atrophy of that ganglion cell. So it's a very, very long one. All right, now, there is a layer in here, the internuclear layer, which is a very busy layer. So we already said there are bipolar cells in there. What other cells live there? Let's name one. Emmercrin cell, another one. Sorry? Horizontal cells. And the last one? Mueller cells. All right, so... Hemocrine and horizontal cells are the first line of processing of an image in the retina. And so those, think about them, they're like octopuses. They send their tentacles out and they're horizontally oriented. And so they already start to touch multiple other cells and they already start processing going on. So there's already visual processing going on right there. And then the Mueller cell, we already said it sends its little fibers all the way to the internal limiting membrane. And so the Mueller cell is kind of the scavenger support cell, if you will. And it pretty much goes almost the whole width of the retina. Okay, so everybody comfortable with the layers? All right, where are we now? What, what part of the retina are we in now? Exactly. So you look at the ganglion cell layer. Ganglion cell layer is multiple cell layers thicker, so we know we're in the macula. Now, when we look at the center of the macula, what is this area called? The fovea. And so if you think about it, that's the part of the eye that gives you your fine vision. And you don't want to have those light rays coming all the way through all those layers of the retina. So the way the retina is designed to avoid that is you see it thins out markedly here in the center of the fovea so that that light reflex, that light ray, I mean, can come all the way in get those photoreceptors here. Now, the center of the fovea is very, very cone rich. And because you want fine vision, one cone links up with one horizontal cell, which links up with one ganglion cell. So because of that, there's a lot of ganglion cells there. So they get stacked up on the side there. So these fibers, as they come out, start to run, not vertically, but start to run obliquely to link with those. Now, it's different in the peripheral retina. The peripheral retina's purpose is to give you side vision and to give you movement and other things. And so in the periphery of the retina, up to 100 rods may be linked up to a single ganglion cell. What does that do? That gives you summation. So if you've ever been out on a dark night and you see, boy, there's a little street light way over here, and then you look at it, it disappears because the the rods all gather that up and do that and so that's important evolutionary wise because you know if there's a saber-toothed tiger sneaking up on you to eat you you want to be able to see that and so that's what the periphery does but in the center you want to be able to see your fine detail and that's why they're all stacked up there so if you look right here you see the fibers here in this layer run almost obliquely what do we call that layer Henley's layer. So Henley's layer runs obliquely. Why is that layer important in the area right next to the center of the fovea? Um, that's where you get Exactly. So that's where edema, cystoid macular edema, starts up. All right. So let's talk a little bit about diseases that can affect the retina. So what do we see in here in this on this photo? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
What do you think could cause this? And believe it or not, even diabetes can cause can cause pictures like this. So, believe it or not, this was a patient who came in and we looked at it and we did all that differential diagnosis. And then, interestingly enough, the student with me at that time said, what's the blood pressure? And we went, gee, I don't know. We searched the entire clinic. Eventually we found, you know, one of those things that goes on your arm that measures blood pressure. And we did it. This patient was 200 over 100, literally. So it went, went right to the ER. This is severe hypertensive retinopathy. Now, sometimes it'll look a little bit different. And good evening. All right, good, good timing. So what are we seeing right here? And you see, they call this a star shape starfish shape. And so that really kind of tracks along Henley's layer. So you get kind of that star shape looking to it. And so this is again a severe hypertensive retinopathy. If you look carefully, you see that that disc, instead of looking that kind of yellowish light pink, it's more red. And so the vessels on that disc are more dilated. And in severe hypertensive retinopathy, you can even get papilledema and severe disc changes. So if you look right here, again, this is a patient with severe hypertensive retinopathy, and you can see in addition to the hemorrhages, you can also see um, exudates here, and you see edema of the optic nerve head. So severe hypertensive retinopathy. All right, what are we seeing right here? So what causes this? All right, so what gives us the cherry red spot? Why do we see that? Exactly. So it's kind of like a window showing you when you have a central retinal artery occlusion, the coronal blood flow is still intact. So in the center of the fovea, where the retina is really thinned out in that area, you can still see normal choroidal blood flow showing through, yet the rest of the retina is ischemic. It's white, it's pale. This is a central retinal artery occlusion. So, uh, what are we seeing right here? Exactly. So this is where not the central retinal artery, but one of the main four branches of the, of the central retinal artery has been occluded. Now, when we look at occlusion of a central retinal artery or just arterial occlusion in general, thrombotic or embolic? Usually embolic. Usually embolic. And so when you see either central retinal artery occlusion or branch artery occlusion, you really need to work up the patient carefully for a source of that. That could be a blood clot. It could be cholesterol plaque, it could be coming from the carotids, it could be coming from the aortic arch, it could be even coming from the heart itself or one of the valves in the heart. So very important that you work this up because if clots are going to the eye, they could be going to the brain and elsewhere. All right, what are we looking at right here? What is this? This is the optic nerve. You can see the central retinal artery in pain. So what's going on with this central retinal artery? So way too many crown burgers and moochies here. And so this is a good old American diet. You can see a ton of cholesterol, lipid. Look at that artery. It is markedly narrowed. And so you can imagine that would predispose that to either a blood clot or a little piece of cholesterol or something that would block that off. So this is where the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein come into the retina together in the optic nerve head. So the other thing I want you to see is you can see this very arteriosclerotic artery 
shares a common adventitial sheath with that vein. And so arteriosclerosis is the most common cause of central retinal artery occlusion. Also, arteriosclerosis is the most common cause of central retinal vein occlusion because that that artery kind of pushes on the vein next to it that can lead to stasis and lead to a vein occlusion. And what are we looking at right here? Um, looks like it's just swollen inner retina, almost. Okay, care to rephrase? So it looks like the RNFL is very swollen. The inner retinal layers are kind of hard to differentiate to me. So I wouldn't use the word swollen. Deminous. I would use the word absent. Absent. And so what you're seeing right here is you're not so much seeing swelling here, but look, that ganglion cell layer is pretty much gone. And you look at that big internuclear layer, all that's left is just the outer third of it. And so this shows nicely where the blood supply of the retina comes from. The outer retina gets its blood supply from the choroid, the outer third. And so the outer nuclear layer and just part of the internuclear layer, they get their blood supply from the choroid. They're still intact. The inner two-thirds of the retina gets its blood supply from the central retinal artery. It's totally wiped out. And so in this part, I wouldn't use swollen. I would use absent. And so you're just looking at retina that's been wiped out, the inner two-thirds from a central retinal artery occlusion. Question. Yes? Is there an exact layer where you can say the one-third starts and the two-thirds ends? Not really. It's just it's a rough rough estimate because it's different in each, in each person. But roughly... You can say that about the outer third of the internuclear layer is from the choroid, and the inner two thirds is from the central retinal artery. Was it really? Yeah. Oh my God. I think it's the outer nuclear layer is like the watershed layer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that's a, that's a, interesting how they do that on OCAPs because I find that OCAPs. they they literally want to separate wheat from chaff, and so there's lots of chaff and. and not much weed in people taking that exam, so they can ask some really obscure questions. All right, what are we seeing here? So this is a, from this photo of a retinae diffuse hemorrhaging from all bonnets. This is on those here, and you kind of blood and thunder appearance. So I love that term, blood and thunder. I don't know what that means, but I don't know what thunder means. But there's a lot of blood, so. Blood and thunder, if you look, all four quadrants are affected. You see that the venules are really dilated here. There's blood everywhere. So central retinal vein occlusion. And again, we said that's caused by arterial sclerosis, causing stasis in that vein. So central vein occlusion. And central vein occlusion is thrombotic, not embolic. Now, what is this right here? It's kind of similar all right, so this is a branch retinal vein occlusion, and you can see a few little cotton wool spots on here. Now, where do those usually occur, those branch retinal vein occlusions? Exactly. So when you've got an arterial sclerotic arteriole and the vein crosses over it, that thick Again, arteriosclerotic arterial presses on that vein, gives you stasis. And so oftentimes when you see these branch retinal vein occlusions, it's at a crossing point where the, the vein crosses over the arterial. And this is an eye cut in half sagittally, and you can see hemorrhages from the optic nerve all the way to the aura serrata, all four quadrants in central retinal vein occlusion. And now you can see this is blood everywhere and ischemic damage because you do get ischemia, you get back out. Damage to the retina diffusely from the central retinal vein occlusion. All right, what are we seeing here? Uh, so, some of the things you can see are a lot of exudates, hypermosy, and then varying types of bridges. There's several flank hemorrhages, um, like some dog hemorrhages too. So, so what's, like, 
What's the difference? Oh, that was good. What gives you flame hemorrhages? What gives you dot hemorrhages? So it depends on where and the is supervision and flame. Oh, they are and then deeper would be like the Okay, so if you think about it, remember that, that nerve fiber layer, it, it comes out and then it runs parallel to the surface of the retina. So if you get superficial hemorrhages, they spread out along that surface. And so we call these flame hemorrhages. Whereas if you get deeper hemorrhages, they tend to be lo more localized and those will be the dot blot hemorrhages. And here we've got lots of exudates. What is this right here? Cotton wool spot. All right, let's keep going. What causes a cotton wool spot? Um, I think it's kind of focal and localized infarction. Yeah, ischemia. I mean, it can be infarction, but certainly localized ischemia. But again, it's of the RNFL. And so if you look at this, uh, the reason people call them cotton wool spots, they look like little pieces of cotton kind of on the surface of the retina instead of deep inside the retina. All right, so we're looking at, at a special preparation of the vessels, the capillaries in the retina. What are we looking at right here? Uh, microaneurysms. All right, so these are little microaneurysms. So these are the first sign of diabetic damage to the retina. So the pericytes tend to drop out. So when you get ischemia from diabetic retinopathy, the pericytes are the first ones to drop out. And then the little capillary wall weakens, and you get these little microaneurysms starting to out. And then you get leakage of blood and you also get exudate. And so this is exudate in the macula. Now this exudate tends to be very lipid rich. It tends to have a lot of yellow in it. And so you can see a lot of lipid here in the macula from the leakage. And this is what it looks like when you look at a pathology. This is exudate right here. And so it's lipid rich, it's protein rich, it's just serum basically leaking out. Eventually a lot of the serum gets reabsorbed, but a lot of the lipid and things get left over. So this is hard exudate here in the, in the retina, especially in the macula. Now, what are we looking at right here? So you're seeing some spots. Exactly, so we're seeing lots of cotton wool spots. Again, they look very superficial. They look like fluffy pieces of cotton on the surface of the retina. And then we look at them, and what are we seeing right here? Exactly. So this is caused by a focal ischemic, eventually infarct, in the nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer, the superficial retina. And so you see this very, very swollen area. And if you look at this at higher power, these are ganglion cells here. And they are very swollen from the ischemia. Now, once the ischemia kills those off, then what happens is the cotton wool spots go away. But if you were to track that, do a multifocal ERG, you could actually find areas where they've dropped out. So you can see swelling from the ischemia acutely, and then eventually that goes down. So cotton wool spots, focal ischemia. What are we seeing right here? Exactly. So this is neovascularization where? Elsin. So it, it's funny that somebody was not imaginative. So you have neovascularization of the disc, and then the other 90% of the retina, if you have, you call it NVE, neovascularization elsewhere. So this is neovascularization elsewhere. And then, of course, this is? Neovascularization of the disc. All right, so NVD. And so we call this the Medusa's look. Remember Medusa from mythology who had the snakes coming out of her head? That's what this looks like. You've got all these dilated vessels in the optic nerve head. Now, it's very interesting. When people first got lasers, there was a xenon arc laser that came out in the 1970s. And these things were amazing. They were like burn a hole through metal. It's very powerful laser. So people said, hey, why don't we treat these and shrink the blood vessels and, and cure neovascularization? So they took the xenon laser and they blasted the blood vessels right on the optic nerve head. Well, what that did is that caused huge loss of nerve fiber layer coming in there and huge damage. But at the same time, they found people with neovascularization elsewhere. They blasted it with a xenon laser. And what happened is not only, not only would the 
the vascularization of the periphery go away, but on the central disc would go away. So what does that tell you about the cause of the neovascularization on the disc? Yeah, so it's from mediators put out by ischemia, and that's a key thing. So VEGF is, is one of them. And so one of the things you can do is you can treat the peripheral retina with laser, decrease the load of ischemic factors coming out, and the neovascularization goes away. Of course, now we've got anti-VEGF injections that we can do, which again, decrease those blood vessels. And so it's chronic ischemia that causes the NVD of the disc. And what can happen if you don't treat this? Exactly. So hard to see where this is because of all the hemorrhage, but this is along the arcade. So you can get not only chronic hemorrhage, but you can get fibrosis. So you really want to treat the diabetic retinopathy before you get to some of these end stages. And of course, the ultimate end stage of NVD is... All right, so what kind of hemorrhage is this? So this is going to be the top there. The bottom, it looks like it's actually in the front of the retina, like the pre-retinal. All right, so it's a pre-retinal hemorrhage, and when you've got a pre-retinal hemorrhage, it's kind of between the surface of the retina and the vitreous, you get what's called a boat shape. And so you see it's flat on top, and then it's kind of curved on the bottom, so you get this pre-retinal boat-shaped hemorrhage. So again, that's a sign of uh, bleeding from neovascularization. So again, you want to try to prevent this from happening. And what's another result of ischemia? You can get neovascularization of the iris and the angle that clogged all up. So this is neovascularization that even an intern would recognize. And so it's called rubiosis iridis or neovascularization. We used to call this ropiosis, you know, because we broke some blood vessels on there. But Problem is, is if you let this neovascularization grow unchecked on the iris, it can cause some issues. What are we seeing right here? All right, so you can see that that retinal pigment, I'm sorry, the iris pigment epithelium has been pulled around the corner. And look at all those little blood vessels on the surface of the iris. And so as you get that neovascularization growing, it contracts. You can pull the pigment epithelium of the iris around the corner. So you end up getting, getting this picture. And what else can this do if you've got neovascularization on the iris? Um, you can get PAS, you can close off the ankle, you can get lacy vascularization, thickening of the vase membrane. So what does PAS stand for? Peripheral anterior sneakia. Exactly. So you get sneakia, you get iris sticking to the peripheral cornea. And the, and the anterior chamber angles clear back here, and so you get blockage and then severe neovascular glaucoma if you don't treat this. And this is what you already said, you get lacy vacuolization of the <coughs> pigment epithelium of the iris, secondary to diabetes. Does that represent a certain stage, like the lacy vacuolization? Yeah, that's usually a later stage. Like PDR? Or, yep, yep. Yeah. It's, it's a very late stage where you've got significant proliferation. What else does diabetes do? So it causes a little thickening of the basement membrane. And what stain is this? So the uh, AES thing. Okay, so I apologize for you guys. Normally I give you the basic lecture first. And, sorry, but so the PAS stain stains for basement membrane, and this nicely shows that the basement membrane of the ciliary body is thickened. Now I have to tell you the story, if you guys have heard it, just roll your eyes, but those who haven't heard it. So when I was a pre-residency fellow doing ophthalmic pathology with Dave Apple, he said, they want some slides to put on board, so pick out some good slides and send them to him. So I picked out some good ones and send them to him. So I sent him this slide. And sure enough, when I took OCAPS as a senior resident, my slide was on there, and I said, oh, wow, thickened basement membrane, diabetes, man, this is great. I'm so smart. And then the question said, A, a patient with this picture would have a urinary creatinine clearance of, B, a peritoneal nerve velocity of, and so they love two-part questions on OCAPs. You guys will hate that because you know it's diabetes, but okay, what is the creatinine clearance? You know it's 
you know, decrease, but what is the number? What is the peritoneal nerve velocity? So even though I, it was my picture, I still don't think I got the question right. So always remember, diabetes, thickened ciliary body basement membrane, and this can pop up occasionally. All right, what the heck is this? Uh, so these are laser spots. Wow. All right, so those are laser spots. And so the idea, again, is we treat the peripheral retina to decrease the ischemic load to then make the neovascularization go away. You do not zap the vessels directly when you do this. Here's a laser spot. Now, it's an argon laser usually, and what it does is it's absorbed by the RPE. You can see that in this laser spot, that RPE is just cooked. The choriocapillaris is sealed off. You get atrophy of the retina overlying it, and then, of course, you've got normal on both sides. So you decrease the load of ischemic retina in the periphery in order to save the center vision and save the center part of the retina. What the heck is this? <laughs> Vessels. There's kind of an edge where there's a lot of abnormal appearance uh, is called C So it's called a C fan. So what do you see this in? What entities? All right. So right up to prematurity, you could see this in a uh, non perfused area where it's just dark, no fluorescent getting in there, and then this C fan neovascularization. Again, this happens to be a patient with sickle cell. So when you have sickle cell, you get a lot of um, sickling of those uh, RBCs, you get ischemia, they block it off, and then you wipe out the peripheral retina and you get these C fans. So this is a patient with sickle cell, and this is a trypsin digest showing this lumpy, bumpy, knobby vasculature from chronic damage from sickle cell. So we just, we don't see a lot of sickle cell in Utah. We just don't have a lot of African-American patients. We saw a ton of this in Chicago, but um, it just depends. But, but you always want to keep this in mind, especially when you've got an African-American patient with some funny peripheral uh, vascular changes. You really want to take a good history and make sure that they don't have sickle cell. All right, what are we seeing right here? So this is a fundus photo of the left eye, and it looks like Edema. Exactly. So that's a macular hole. And this is the picture. What the heck is that thing in there coming out of the hole? Exactly. So that's all right. But then once in a while, see if you guys actually look at these pictures. So if the patient has trouble fixating, they, they sometimes put a rod in there. So that's a fixation rod showing you that. But there's a nice close up of a full thickness macular hole. And of course, this is what kind of a scan? OCT. OCT. And you can see not only is there a full thickness hole, but what else can, can happen with these macular holes? Um, well, to make the ventral retinal traction, so we get um, attachment. Okay, well, that's what can ultimately happen, but that's not on this picture. What else is this picture showing? Edema as well. Edema, exactly. So there's a little bit of edema next to this. So oftentimes you'll have a full thickness hole, but you'll have a rim of some thickening of the cornea due to edema. So the idea now, especially with the these really high resolution OCTs we have nowadays, we want to pick these up where there's traction early on before it forms a full thickness hole. And so we will often try to catch these early where we can treat them before it causes that. And then pathologically, you can see that here's a full thickness hole. It's in the center of the macula, the ganglion cell layer, multiple cell layers thick. Look at the edema now. It looks just like the OCT, edema next to the full thickness hole in the macula. All right, what do we see in here? So, uh, a little bit of a gum looks like an ERM. And what's the hint that tells you it might be an ERM? These vessels, it's like someone has kind of grabbed them and pulled them in a little bit. And so that's the subtle sign of an epiretinal membrane. Now, this is not so subtle. Again, in turn, you can pick this up. You can see a severe epiretinal membrane with wrinkles. And so epiretinal membrane, think of it as a cellophane membrane on the surface of the macula. And then think of it as crinkling up like cellophane does. And it can cause that, that kind of a change. 
And red-free photos show this nicely. This is a red-free photo. See the straightening of the vessels? And you can see this epiretinal membrane right here on the surface of the retina. And this kind of shows you, again, the <coughs> OCT shows it nicely. This is an old OCT. I have to replace this with a better one. But you can see, again, the membrane on the surface of the macula. And this is what it looks like pathologically. You basically get this corrugated appearance, this irregular wrinkling. And so what happens is um, astrocytes, which live inside the retina, you don't think of them, but there are some in there, they will gain access to the surface of the retina and then they'll start proliferating and making this epiretinal membrane. All right, what are we seeing right here? All right, what are drusen? Exactly. So we look at a drusen. Some people even call it intra-RPE. So this is a good place to talk a little bit about Brooks membrane. Now normally I would talk about this when I show you the normal anatomy and just this morning I forgot. So what are the layers of Brooks membrane? It's a five-layered sandwich. Okay. of the Good, good. So it's a five layer sandwich, Brooks membrane. And so you think about it, it's like those turkey sandwiches you get at a, a bad restaurant where you have bread, which is the basement membrane on both sides, and you have two layers of really fibrous, collagenous turkey, and then a layer of elastic tissue, which is the cheese. So you've got cheese, two layers of collagenous turkey, two layers of bread. So it's a five-layered sandwich. So technically, if you talk about drusen, they are under the basement membrane of the RPE, but on top of the collagenous layer. So technically, they're intra-RPE. So here they are. And you alluded, Ali alluded to the fact that these are kind of waste products of the RPE building up. So if you think about it, the RPE is a very, very busy you know, layer. What does the RPE do? What are some of its functions? Okay, how does it do that? Okay, so now Brooks membrane does not stop transfer of stuff, and so the choriocapillaris is very porous. Materials come out of the choriocapillaris. The outer, um, you know, retinal junctions that, that, that are kind of the outer blood retinal barrier are, is actually the RPE. So the RPE has tight junctions in it. So fluid doesn't just flow passively, it flows actively, and so you get transformation of nutrients coming from the choriocapillaris into the outer retina, which is extremely metabolically active. What else does the RPE do? Yeah. I don't know if you just said that. I'll, I'll I just said that. Yeah, yeah. absorbs pigment. All right, so it, it will actually, it's got pigment in it, so it absorbs light. And so it helps to decrease glare. So if you have an albino patient, man, light really bothers them. But n normally, the rest of us, we've got that RPE there that absorbs some of the light so we don't get... Um, you know, we don't get so much glare. What else does the RPE do? All right, so it's kind of like a recycling factory, if you think of it. So those outer segments of the rods and cones, they eventually slough off. The RPE takes them. It re-esterifies them, it makes them like new, and then it puts them back out into the retina. So it really has a, you know, a, a really rebuilds. So it has a recycling, um, you know, component. So if you could imagine over the years that just a 
lot of that stuff builds up in there. You get a lot of lipofusin, some pigment, a lot of breakdown products, and eventually it overwhelms that cell. It starts spitting them out and it forms these drusen, which are the first sign of age-related macular degeneration. And what is this? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a giant drusen. And so you can get small, so-called hard drusen. You can get large, so-called soft drusen. So sometimes these drusen can be really big and it causes disruption of the overlying RPE layer. And eventually you can get, you know, the loss of the photoreceptors there and then you get the loss of vision from macular degeneration. Here you can see a lot of drusen and you can see the RPE changes starting from macular degeneration. Now, these are what we call confluent drusen. It's your drusen all along here. So you get a lot of soft drusen kind of linked together and you get loss of RPE overlying them and significant loss of central vision. So what's happening right here? This is a fundus photo of the left eye, and I see um, black um, areas in the macula. What else do you see? It's kind of subtle in this picture. Um, I see kind of But believe it or not, right here, I'll outline it, the RPE in this area has been completely wiped out. It's a little bit of pigment around the edges. This is what we call geographic atrophy. So when you get significant enough changes from major related macular degeneration, the RPE gets completely wiped out. You get what's called geographic atrophy. So this is what it looks like. Here's Brooks' membrane right here. You look right here, the RPE has been completely completely wiped out and therefore the retina overlying it has got no, you know, none of the RPE functions taking care of it so it gets wiped out. So this is what's called the end stage of geographic atrophy. And so this is macular degeneration. Unfortunately, we don't have good treatments for this yet. What do we see in right here? Oh, I'm sorry, question. Yes. For like pseudodrusen or reticular drusen that are of the RPE? Do they not, does that not interfere with its function and transport and everything? It does also. Yep. yep. So they're, they're kind of like, think of reticular pseudodrusen as they kind of like do the same kind of damage the drusen do. All right. Well, while we're there, what is this? Yes, yeah, so you can see along the inferior macula, maybe a little hemorrhage there. It looks elevated. Once you go to reflex, and then you can see like a darker, deeper greenish grayish color, which makes me think that there's subretinal fluid there. Yeah, so when you see this dark greenish color, not only is it subretinal, but it's actually sub-RPE. So this is a sign of neovascularization. It can be under the, you know, under the retina, but it can also even be under the RPE. And when it's green like this, the RPE is still overlying it. So this is neovascularization from age-related macular degeneration. And this is a nice picture. I, I had to copy this because I didn't have a pretty picture like this. But here's the choroid. Here's the overlying retina. Here's some fibrosis going on here, gliosis. And here's a break in Brooks membrane. And you see the neovascularization coming through, going underneath the RPE. So you not only get hemorrhage, but you also get fibrosis from the wet macular degeneration. And this is a severe one. This is subretinal when it's red and kind of sub-RPE when it's green or black. So this is a severe neovascular membrane underneath the macula. And you can see right here, here's an area of a focal neovascularization with fibrosis. And so you'll start to get fibrosis underlying this. Here's a close-up. Subretinal fibrosis, RPE broken up, and a few little tiny vessels right in here. So neovascular fibrotic membrane underlying the macula for mutilated macular degeneration. This is a severe one. We used to call this a discoform scar, which is a dense, thick, 
fibrotic scar underlying the retina. This is the end stage of neovascular um, age-related macular degeneration. All right, what are we looking at right here? This is a fungus photo of the right eye. Um, some scarring, focal spots um, around the macula as well as um, around the retina itself, kind of consistent with potentially some disc-form scars, like histo. Okay, so some scarring in the retina, but, but what are these lesions? They're away from the retina and they're round and fairly distinct. This is a tip off for something else that can cause neovascularization of the macula. Not discoform scarring. Well, it, it can cause discoform scarring, but in, in age related macular degeneration, you don't have these peripheral lesions. What entity can you have peripheral lesions along with the macular lesion? Exactly. So now you have to put the P in front of it. The P stands for presumed ocular histoplasmosis because we often don't find living bugs in there. But you can find evidence of previous histoplasmosis infection. And these are called the punched out lesions. And so they call them punched out because they're focal and they're like punched out lesions in the periphery. And then eventually you can get some neovascularization and some scarring in the macula. So this is presumed ocular histoplasmosis. What are we seeing right here? Yeah, you kind of see some elevation here. And so you would be really suspicious that something's going on in here. And so we do a fluorescein angiogram. Remember what those were? Do you guys still do fluorescein angiograms? I know we, we had the, we call the fluorescein angiogram conference, it's mostly OCTs, but if you do a fluorescein angiogram, you have this picture. What does this show? <laughs> All right, so if you remember, we showed you Henley's layer that goes out obliquely. And so when you get leakage in the area around the fovea, that fluid tends to track along Henley's layer, and they call this kind of a flower petal distribution. So this is cystoid macular edema, and this shows it pathologically. Remember, we said it's in Henley's layer or in the outer plexiform layer right here. And here you see exudate here and here. Here's the outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, and it's right there in Henley's layer. There's the ganglion cell layer, multiple cell layers thick. So this is cystoid macular edema. All right, what do we see in here? Models of the macula. So this is one, you know, gosh, I don't know if we can turn those lights down a little bit. My view is so much better than this. I'm sorry we've got, well, that helps a little bit. This is one where you kind of have to use your imagination and looking at this pattern. So I apologize, this shows up much better on my picture than up there. This is a bullseye maculopathy. And so if you look, you can see some you know, modeling of RPE here and then a more red outline around it. So this is called a bullseye maculopathy. Now, what are some entities that can cause bullseye maculopathy? Sometimes some of the psychiatric meds can cause this too. But the most common one that you may be seeing patients in clinic to rule out is Plaquenil toxicity. And so you obviously don't want to let it get to this point. You want to recognize it sooner. And nowadays, you know, we can do macular OCT, we can do central visual fields and patients who have been on Plaquenil to make sure they don't get to this point where you get this bullseye maculopathy. And this is the fluorescein angiogram. And rather than leakage, you get little tiny focal staining of that area. And this shows the bullseye pattern much nicer when you do the fluorescein. So bullseye maculopathy. What are we seeing right here? This looks like uh, angioid streaks. All right. So again, almost kind of like D 
deeper medusa snakeheads. And so these are what we call angioid streaks right here. What are angioid streaks? Breaks in Brooks membrane. Exactly. So they're focal breaks in Brooks membrane. Now, why would I be showing you a picture of somebody's neck? <laughs> I actually just saw a picture of this uh, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Exactly. So they call this a pluck chicken look. I'm, I'm not from the farm like some of you Iowa people are. <laughs> I don't know what a pluck chicken looks like, but they call this the pluck chicken look. And so you can see the skin. This is a patient with pseudoxanthoma elasticum. And it's a, it's a connective tissue disorder, and therefore it affects Brooks membrane. So you can get these angioid streaks, and, and they can sometimes allow neovascularization to form. And so they're important that you recognize those. What are we looking at right here? Um, I wonder if you just put those same like pale nerve, um, some attenuated muscles, and then um, even clumping. So I'm thinking of whether right just put Exactly. So this picture kind of shows you pretty much all of the findings of an advanced retinitis pigmentosa because you get wiping out of the retina, you get a pale optic nerve, you get the vessels markedly attenuated, and then as you go out to the periphery, they call this the bony spicule look to the pigment, you know, the pigment. And so what happens is, is the RPE gets disrupted. And then the pigment will track along the blood vessels. And so that's why you get that bony spicule. The pigment is, is released from the damaged RPE and then it'll almost diffuse out along the blood vessels. And there's the blood vessels there with the pigment on it. And so that's what you get in retinitis pigmentosa. And again, the retina guys will talk to you about the various genetics and all the other factors involved. But pathologically, the final common denominator is, is that the retinal pigment epithelium gets wiped out the retina itself gets atrophied, and then you get the pigment along the blood vessels forming the bony spicules. What are we seeing right here? This is a yellowish elevation of the phobia. It's like a form dystrophy. Yeah, so it kind of looks like, we like to tell people, it looks like an egg yolk. So if a teleform dystrophy, or there's a type of a teleform dystrophy, best dystrophy that can look like this. So you see that egg yolk underneath the retina in the center, and you can see this vitelliform lesion is actually underneath the RPE right here, forming the vitelliform uh, maculopathy lesion. Okay, what are we seeing right here? Small yellowish So people call these pisiform. Pisiform literally means fish-like. And so if you think about it, you know those little goldfish, you know, crackers that you eat? It kind of looks like, eh, kind of, like, again, you know, you get people, sometimes you wonder how they, they describe these, but it's called pisiform. So you see these little tiny changes here. And so this is consistent with, you said it, Stargardt's disease, okay, or fundus flavi maculata. And so this is characterized by deposition of lipofusin into the RPE right here. So... There's a, it's lipofusin rich and can disturb the macula also, but then can cause these peripheral lesions, Stargardt's disease. What are we seeing right here? I see a, a red top of this. Yeah. Uh, some whiteness. I don't really see very many vessels, so I'm assuming there's something with arthritis. Exactly. So this is a vitritis, and people call this look the headlight in the fog. Because the headlight being, all you can see is a little bit of that white optic nerve head through the fog. So this is vitritis. So what are some of the things you think about in vitritis? Okay, so when you think about it, when you see this kind of a vitritis picture, you want to make classifications. So I tell people, make little mailboxes in your brain, like the mailboxes upstairs. And so one mailbox says inflammatory, one mailbox says infectious. There's a third mailbox you want to always keep in mind when you see a vitritis. Uh, that's great, like uh, uh, primary behavioral. 
Exactly. So you've got vitreoretinal lymphoma can present as a vitritis. And so those are kind of the three categories you always want to keep in mind when you see a picture like this. And this shows you kind of the path on this. This was that, maybe had that picture five years ago. So what are we seeing here? What do we think the diagnosis is here? This was toxo. And so when you have toxo acutely, you get the headlight and the fog, you get a, a vitreal retinal inflammation. And then eventually when it settles down, you get this heavy pigmentation with these white lacunae where the RPE has been totally wiped out in this area. And so this is a previous toxoplasmosis that's not actively infected. When you look at it pathologically, you see the RPE gets totally wiped out in this area. And the pigment can go up on the edge. This is an ocular toxoplasmosis. All right, what do we see in here? Okay, so when you see a patient like this, they call this again maybe the ketchup or the pizza look to it. And so this could be, could be CMV. And then we look, and when you look at the retina itself, you can get intraretinal, I mean intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion. So you get these swollen retina cells. And so this can occur in people who are immunocompromised. We used to see it in people with HIV before we had triple therapy, but even people who have undergone bone marrow transplants or are being treated for uh, systemic cancers can get CMV retinitis flaring up. All right, so we say goodbye. We made it. We say goodbye to the Duomo and Milano. Um, next time, I believe it's Orbit. I don't know, but please look and see. So please read that section of the BCS ahead of time. Go ahead and we'll do that. And then we're just going to, you guys have me for, for the next seven Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. Now we've got exactly two minutes. Questions? Was it a picture of toxicocrine appearance? Was that a fungus photo? Was the rest surrounding You know, I can't put anything by you guys. This is a enucleated globe that was doing it. And so that's why it looks that way. So this is actually a globe that's been cut. That's what allowed us. They have that path picture. Yeah, a good pickup. That was a good pickup there. So you get the gold star for the day. That was a good pickup. All right, any other questions?